Okay, so we are now recording. All right, guys. Well, welcome to our second um, virtual open mic. Um, I'm Olivia, and I'm the founder of uh, Humor Beats Cancer. And so you can find this this type of information um, on um, humorbeatscancer.com and as well as on our, our different social media at uh, Humor Beats Cancer or Humor Beat Cancer. Uh, today we have three lovely ladies who um, have also blogged for um, Humor Beats Cancer and they're going to share some of their funny cancerous stories. You know, if it's possible to put cancer and funny into the same word, uh, we're, we're trying to do that. So, um, uh, so we'll just, you know, going to kick it off right now with, um, with Christine. Hi. Okay. So my name is Christine Handy and I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2012. Oh, wait. There you go. Sorry about that. Okay. Let me start over. Hi, my name is Christine Handy and I live in Miami and I was diagnosed with breast cancer on October 1st, 2012, which is kind of ridiculous because October is breast cancer awareness month. So I was diagnosed October 1st. So I, the entire month was pink everywhere. And I just was like, Oh my God, stop that. That would have been a funny, that's funny. <laughs> um, since my diagnosis, I've had, um, probably nine or 10 surgeries uh, related to cancer. And I had 28 rounds of chemo. So I went through a lot and I um, wrote a book about my journey, which has become a national bestseller and it's actually being made into a film. So once the whole world comes back um, and to life and hopefully that film will continue to nurture anyway. So I'm going to share my kind of funny story. Going through uh, chemo for 15 months, you do have a lot of stories. So this is just a little cute one. Uh, there are so many funny stories about my journey. I had many women who stood beside me, brightened my days and lightened my load. Life changes when people stand by each other. One day I was home alone and my right arm was in a cast. That, that was a whole nother issue. I had a whole, I actually had two issues going on at the same time, same time cancer and um, my right arm. I could not use my arm. It had just been fused and the pain was tremendous. It had been over a year of that intense pain in my arm, and now I was just starting my chemo journey. I was sitting at my kitchen table alone, nobody was home, and I just started to sob. The magnitude of what had happened to me was overwhelming. I didn't hear the front door open. I felt so scared and so alone that I crawled underneath my table with a blanket over my head and just laid there and cried. Suddenly, one of my friends had walked into the kitchen. I could hear her on her cell phone. She was talking to somebody, I could hear her footsteps walking over in my direction because usually we had met at my kitchen table. She didn't see me at the kitchen table, so she started to walk around my house. Finally, she came back into the kitchen and I guess she looked down underneath the table and saw me under there. She went from having a full business conversation on her phone to stopping mid-sentence and saying, I'm gonna have to call you back. Uh, and then she said to me, oh, sweetie. And then I heard her put her purse down and kneel down beside me. She said, honey, just because you are a stick figure and a yogini who can crawl under any table doesn't mean I can. So please don't make me come underneath there. Just come out from under the table and we're gonna make this better. <laughs> so we just burst into tears. I mean, we just burst into laughter because she was like, don't make me come underneath that table. I will if I have to, but please don't. And so she just completely changed it, changed the, the tone of the, of the environment from just feeling such despair and, and loneliness to laughing and enjoying her companionship. So that's my little vignette. I think you're muted, Olivia. All right. Thank, can you hear me now? Yeah, oh my gosh. So, so this is like, this, this is real life here. This is me, real life. A few mistakes on the way to the journey. A few mistakes. <laughs> thank you, Christine. That's beautiful. That's so beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, all right. So let's, um, let's move on. Uh, Katie, do you want to go next? Sure. I'd love to. Oh, am I muted? No, you can hear me. Can okay, you hear me? Hold on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute everybody. Hold on, let's do this right. Okay. And then we're gonna get you unmuted. Okay, unmute all. Okay. <clears throat> okay, ready? Can you hear me? Yes? 
Okay. Okay. Hello. I'm Katie and I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer at the age of 30 in 2018. Um, I'm currently taking tamoxifen and I'm on Lupron injections. Um, menopause has been fun. Just kidding. Um, and I've recently added physical therapy to my regimen because I have an encapsulated left implant. So that is on our to-do list right now. Um, I'm going to read a story about my port. <laughs> it's called Pick a Color, Any Color. After having my double mastectomy, I learned that I had a positive lymph node, which meant chemotherapy was now a part of my treatment. Before I knew it, I was in the appointment to discuss how my port would be placed. The nurse went through the procedure and explained how surgery is simple and shouldn't cause any issues. At the end of the appointment, she was showing me what the port looked like and said, ports come in all different colors. Wait, why are we discussing the color of the port? What the hell does this have to do with placing a foreign object into my body? Will having a fancy colored port make things easier? I became fascinated at the idea of having a pretty colored port in my body. I thought about it on more than one occasion. I can remember calling my mom and telling her that my port would be a color. We talked about it for a while, like that's just what you talk about on a Tuesday afternoon. I couldn't not think about it. I felt like the nurse was trying to say, the process is easier. Don't worry, a fancy colored port will make chemotherapy better. The day I had my port placed was anything but simple. The doctor tried to thread it on my right side, but had to switch to my left. During the switch, I began to vomit and caused lots of commotion in the operating room. Even though the simple surgery turned into chaos, I still wondered what color had been chosen. Fast forward to the day I finally got my port removed. My port did its job, but not well. I remember I never had blood return and the thing rotated on its side, so accessing was such a problem. I had anxiety every time the nurse got out the extra long needle to shove into my port. I was more than ready to have it removed. While the nurse was prepping me, I explained to her how ports come in all colors, as if she cared or didn't know. And I demanded to know what color mine was. Knowing the color of my port didn't change anything about my cancer journey, but man, I needed to know. Waking up from surgery was easy this time, and I immediately asked the question that I needed my answer to. I said, what color is it? The nurse said, what? I said, my port, what color? The nurse said, light purple. I said, that's pretty. I beat cancer. I'm a badass. A couple minutes later, my husband proceeded to tell me that I said, I could go for a Big Mac. Here's the thing, I've never had a Big Mac in my life, so apparently removing my pretty purple port had created some new cravings. To this day, I laugh about the nurse talking about the color as if I were able to pick a color as my prize. I imagined the surgeon rummaging through a box of ports to find the perfect color to match my personality and give me some sort of fate to my journey. I never got to see my port, so the nurse could have just told me a color to satisfy my rational need to know. I never did get that Big Mac, that I so desperately craved that day, I found out my port was light purple. That's all I got. That is awesome. Everybody should be unmuted. Let's see. Oops. All right. That was beautiful. Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, really Mine was purple too. That was my favorite color. So I was pretty excited about that. Awesome. I didn't even know I, they I, came I, in colors. Me either. I, I, this is like totally new information. I'm bummed I didn't ask. I know. I think it was an I think it was an icebreaker with the nurse. You know, you're in there feeling awkward and she's like, but guess what? They come in colors. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. I would have totally wanted to pick my color too. That would have been like a thing I would have been right up my alley too. I'm, 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 I they feel like mine must have been boring or something. I don't know. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Renee, you ready to go? Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Renee Elena. I'm 34 years old. I'm from Lompoc, California. I uh, was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma, which is a, a tumor of the soft tissue in my neck at the age of 31. Um, I went through 14 rounds of chemo, 31 rounds of radiation, and a surgery to remove partial tumor. And I am currently uh, one year uh, after treatment, no evidence of disease, and I just celebrated my one year cancer anniversary. And here's my story. I wrote this about two years ago, so it's kind of in the middle of my treatment. 
So hello, my name is Renee. I'm 32 years old and from Lapa, California. I was diagnosed with localized soft tissue urine sarcoma of the neck. I was living in Las Vegas, Nevada when I first discovered the tumor, working as an assistant property manager for a commercial real estate company. I was starting to travel, having the time of my life when three little words changed my life forever. You have cancer. My whole life was ripped away from me in a matter of seconds. I had surgery to remove a portion of my tumor and immediately began a very aggressive treatment of chemotherapy and radiation. Part of my journey, which I have openly shared, has been to inform people of how I discovered my tumor and how important it is to listen to your body and to be your own advocate when it comes to your health. It took me almost a year and a lot of persistence and fighting on my part to get diagnosed. I was misdiagnosed several times and went through several doctors who would not listen to me, but I knew my body and I knew something was not right. It has been eight months into my treatment now. I've done several rounds of intense chemotherapy, rounds of radiation, and over six hospital stays, including the ICU. I've continued to have a positive outlook despite my circumstances, and I've had some pretty humorous moments in between. As many cancer patients know, chemotherapy is so hard on the body and the pain can be so intense, I find myself going neutropenic low blood clouds every time. As I found myself right back in the ER for the upteenth time, I have to be transported by ambulance to larger hospitals about 45 minutes away. Now, I'm usually pretty lucky to have a couple cute EMT guys who are not too bad to look at. And let me tell you something, I may have been sick, puking, and on IV drugs, but I am never too sick to flirt. But on this particular ambulance ride, I got a couple of older gentlemen, super nice guys, about 20 minutes into the ride, I see these two large speakers in front of me on the door in the back of the van. All of a sudden, they start blasting country music and singing. Now, don't get me wrong, I have nothing against country music, but when I'm sick as bleep, puking, and high as heck undilated, that's the last thing I want to hear. I mean, let's play some soothing Enya or something and try to promote healing, for crying out loud. I'm like, are you trying to kill your patients? Usually the ride is pretty quiet. I was giggling so hard inside. I was like, okay, uh, just, Jesus, take me now. I'm done. I'm ready to go. I was laughing so hard. I will tell you this. I couldn't find, if I couldn't find laughter in the darkest of moments, I would not be able to get through this. Cancer can take a lot from you. It can put your body through hell, but it can never take my spirit. Great. Beautiful. Yes. Oh, wait, did we lose a few people? I can see Christine. That was great. Oh, I don't know if I, Katie and uh, Renee, I don't know if I see just, you guys. Uh, I think it just locked up for a second. Oh. I'm still here. Okay, guys. <laughs> you guys are shrouded in mystery right now. <laughs> can I hear? I can hear you guys for sure. I can see everybody. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. I think you guys are coming back. Cool. <laughs> well, that was super funny too. Let me see here. Um, can we see each other or no? <laughs> can you guys? I can see everybody now. I think. Can everybody see each okay. other? Okay. So, um, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I see everyone, but Olivia, you're still frozen. I know. I don't know what's yes. going. On today with this very sad but um it's still yeah she's frozen on the screen i'm not sure how to i know get rid of that hmm. let's see <laughs> let's see speaker view maybe have her stop her video for a second all right hold on let me okay so kind of to resume um i i've been kind of asking people um how has kind of what you've learned from going through cancer, how has it kind of helped you cope now through the pandemic? Um, you know, is any anything that you've been able to take from that experience to this new experience or any advice that you have for people who are kind of feeling that isolation or that uncertainty that often, you know, we feel when we go through cancer? Um, and so I just kind of thrown that out there. Is there any, any advice or anything that you've kind of, that's helped you get through this that you took from your cancer experience? Um, yeah. Okay. I, people have asked me the same thing. Can, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
people have asked me the same thing. And I think it's, um, you know, when you go through chemo for 15 months or however many months that people go, their trial goes through them, it's, you remember after that it's a season. The COVID, the COVID-19 is a season in our life. And oftentimes before I was diagnosed with cancer, I used to think, oh, this is going to last forever. My kids are always going to be in this stage of their life. And the truth is it seasons end and different seasons begin. And so what I just, that's just what I give people that kind of hope because, you know, it does look very daunting right now. There's no cure. There's no, we don't, you know, everybody's telling a different, do this, don't do this, wear a mask, mm-hmm. don't wear a mask. It's very confusing. Um, just, we have to remember it's a season. So that's my, that's what I keep telling people. Okay. It will end. That's really beautiful. Yeah. No, that's a good way. To there will be it. another season. different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what about the I rest think, of you? Um, for us, like during our cancer treatment, it's kind of almost the same as far as like the going through the isolation and the hand sanitizing and the kind of like I went, we went, I went through that through my cancer treatment. So to, as far as like preparing wise, I think it's something, it's like nothing really like, you know, new. So now it's like kind of funny that the whole world is going through it now, mm-hmm. you know, and kind of seeing maybe kind of what we go through, but kind of like, um, she was saying just the, um, yeah, it's a season. It's, it's, it will, we'll get through it. And I think I'm just learning what cancer has taught me is just to be grateful, grateful for the little things, um, find things that bring you joy and peace and calm to get through it. And that's kind of what gets me through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I would say I'm definitely more self-aware mm-hmm. <laughs> during all of this after my cancer thing, you know, wash hands, all of that. I feel like I'm more self-aware of myself. Um, I'm home with two little kids, so our life is still busy, even though we haven't been able to leave. Um, and I, I agree. I think we just need to think this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. That's, we have to keep that in our minds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just as, you know, as you shared your stories about humor and using humor as a coping tool, um, how, if you could just talk generally a little bit about how has humor been a helpful tool when dealing with tough times, particularly cancer? Well, I mean, <laughs> I'll start. Humor is often difficult to find in the darkest moments. Um, and it's very helpful to hear other people talk about their humorous moments during their difficult times. And so while I'm, I'm a big believer in social media, but I'm also, I also don't believe in social media because I think that, you know, we're meant to interact. We're meant to live in community. But the good thing about social media right now is we can, you know, depending on who we follow, we can, you know, watch these videos that cheer us up and make us feel better. And, and so even in the darkest moments, you know, social media can be used as a tool for that. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I kind of discerned um, in the beginning of this who I was following because it was becoming very dark. You know, I, I'm not speaking as much and, you know, everybody has been affected by this. And so I had to really go through my phone and my, who I was listening to and the voices I was listening to and the social media feeds I was watching. And I kind of, I took inventory, but then I changed some of them. And I, and I followed more people that, you know, brought humor into my life. And you know, it's, it's a decision that we need to make, but it's, you know, again, I think we have to search out for those types of things during really dark moments. And so I think social media right now can be a tool for that, but we have to seek it out. Mm-hmm. And you just can't take life too serious. That's my whole thing. I, you just, to find the humor in like, to me, it's simple to find the humor in things like it's bizarre you sign up to sit in a chemo chair to have poison pumped into your body like okay <laughs> like this is so strange so mm-hmm. I to me just I I don't take life super serious because it could be gone tomorrow mm-hmm. yeah. well um anything else you guys want to add before we say goodbye I don't know about you guys but not only not only go ahead well not not only just on um yeah, on Katie's point is so true. Not only did we sign up to sit in that chair, there were times when I was, I, I couldn't sit in that chair because my, my levels were too low. And that was a dark day for me. Mm-hmm. And I would think to myself, wow, like I went from, I can't believe I'm going to have to have chemo. I'm never going to sit in that chair to, 
I have to get chemo today. Mm -hmm. How can I make sure I get chemo today? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you just think about that, yeah. you know, there has to be some humor in that because it's so crazy. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I applaud how you can just say, well, I, I look for humor in many things. That's not my personality. <laughs> so I really have to search it out. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's like ways like this, like humor beats cancer. It's things like that, that I have to watch and see in order to uh, put humor into my life. So you're, you're definitely a blessing in this world for sure. Yes, you are. Well, I'm just, I, I'm lucky that I got to spend today with you guys. Um, thank you so much. Um, you inspire me, you make me smile and you're just, I'm so lucky to have met you three. So thank you so much for taking time out of your, out of your day to, to participate in this. Um, I, you know, I send you much love, humor your way and, um, you know, thank you so much. All right. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thanks for having us. It was nice to meet you all. Yes. Definitely. Nice to meet you too. Well, have a great rest of your Definitely day. Definitely let us know if you ever have that Big Mac. Yes. Oh, I will. <laughs> Definitely. We need to know. Yeah. I think McDonald's yes. is actually open. Oh, <laughs> they are. <laughs> I heard they're getting away to fries right now. So. It's essential. Yes. yes. The Big Macs are essential. That's funny. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys. Yes. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.